In this lecture, we start our discussion of cranial nerves. We'll start at the bottom and work our way up. First, we'll review the brainstem tracks, which are shown in the cartoon here, containing both descending and ascending tracts. Then we'll step through cranial nerves 9 through 10. Collectively, these will innervate the oropharyngeal components but the vagus will extend beyond the pharynx, hitting the esophagus, the rest of the GI tract, the heart, providing the majority of parasympathetic innervation. We should think of the brain stem as the junction between brain and spinal cord. Like the spinal cord, it has a number of nerves that come off of it. These are the cranial nerves. And also like the spinal cord, it has a number of tracts running through it. Like the brain, there are a few areas that do a bit of processing. So there's a few special nuclei that we're going to highlight as well. First, let's go through our axon tracts. The first one is the corticobulbar tract. The corticobulbar tract is kind of like the corticospinal tract, except it deals with connecting the cortex to the brainstem. That's what bulbar means there. So we still have upper motor neurons in the cortex, and the lower motor neurons, rather than being in the spinal cord, are in the brainstem. In general, cortical bulbar fib fibers are bilateral. Two exceptions. The lower face and the tongue are contralateral. Everything else we should consider as bilateral. For example, innervation of the trigeminal motor nucleus for chewing is bilateral. You chew with both sides of your jaw. The upper face is generally bilateral. We tend to be able to raise both eyebrows and very few people can raise only one eyebrow. On the other hand, we can control the two sides of our mouth independently. You can give a half smile on one side, and that's because of the contralateral innervation of the lower face. This is highlighted in this cartoon here. What we have is um, the upper motor neurons living in the cortex and the lower motor neurons living down there in the pons, the facial nucleus. And what they're showing you here are lesions in two different places. In, on the left, we have uh, damage to the facial nerve. So our lesion occurs at the facial nerve. This will damage the lower motor neurons innervating both the upper and lower halves of the face. And so we'll see weakness in both the upper and lower quadrants. However, if we have damage in the cortex, damaging the upper motor neurons, notice that we only have contralateral innervation for that green uh, lower face lower motor neuron, but for the purple upper face motor neuron, we have input from both sides of the brain. Both the left and the right side have upper motor neurons providing input to that upper face, lower motor neuron. So yes, we have damaged one of those fibers. And we've damaged input to the lower face, lower motor neuron, but we have one surviving fiber. And that allows our upper face, lower motor neuron to continue to function. As a result, we have normal tone in the upper portion of the face, but we see drooping in the lower quadrant. This will distinguish stroke in the cortex affecting the upper motor neurons from Bell's palsy, which is caused by damage to the facial nerve. The other contralateral innervation is the hypoglossal nucleus, so we can control the two sides of our tongue a bit independently. Everything else we should consider as bilateral. 
Here's an example of Bell's palsy. So what we want to look at here is the wrinkles on the forehead. Notice how the gentleman's right side still has wrinkles, but the left side is smoothed out, and that's because of a decrease in muscle tone. Notice he can raise his right eyebrow much better than his left. So we see upper and lower weakness of the left side of the face. And this indicates damage to the facial nerve as opposed to the corticobulbar tract. Another uh, set of fibers running in the brainstem are those that connect the cortex to the cerebellum and cerebellum to the cortex. So we've got a couple here to think about. First of all, there's the input, the cortico ponto cerebellar tracts. And those are shown on the cartoon labeled number one. So it starts in the cortex. We project down to the pons. These fibers then cross over to the contralateral cerebellum. Remember, the right side of the cortex controls the left side of the body. So this right side is going to cross over eventually controlling the left side of the body. The cerebellum is ipsilateral, so the left side of the cerebellum should also control the left side of the body. So this cross should make good sense to us. We'll of course go through our granule cell, to Purkinje cell, to deep nucleus, the deep nucleus being the dentate. That's this single step simplification here. And then fiber tract number two is the connection between the dentate to the cortex, called the dentatothalamocortical tract. So from the dentate to the thalamus, and from the thalamus, of course, up to the cortex. And now we have our feedback. This allows us to select the appropriate upper motor neurons so that we have the correct output to either the corticobulbar or corticospinal tracts. We also have sensory tracts. The counterpart to the posterior column medial lemniscus pathway and the spinal thalamic tracts are the trigeminal lemniscus. There are really two tracts here, but collectively we call them the trigeminal lemniscus. One tract deals with pain and temperature, and that would be those fibers that arrive at the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal. We'll give this its own lecture, but the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal is called that because it extends down into the spinal cord. So it spans from pons through the medulla down to the spinal cord. That is our spinal nucleus of the trigeminal. A delta and C fibers provide input here, so it's pain and temp. Tactile sensation from A beta fibers arrives at the pontine nucleus. Both of these cross over in the trigeminal lemniscus. Again, just like the posterior column medial lemniscus pathway and the spinal thalamic tract, the secondary afferents here cross over, hitting the tertiary afferents in the thalamus. Slightly different area, not the ventral posterior lateral nucleus, that's for the body. Here we hit the ventral posterior medial nucleus, and that's for the face. Indeed, we have a body map here. Our face is in the medial parts, and the rest of our body is spread out in the lateral portion of the ventral posterior medial nucleus. Those fibers from the spinal nucleus also target the intralaminar nuclei, stimulating arousal in response to pain. From the thalamus, we project to the cortex to create the impression 
of where the sensation or pain is. This schematic shows us the relationship between the face, upper, and lower limbs. The way that we get that map in the cortex is because of the organization of the fibers in our posterior column medial lemniscus pathway and the uh, trigeminal lemniscus. Notice those fibers arising from the lowest levels are going to go uh, to different areas than those that arise from higher levels. So we got a couple of fibers running here. We've got our good old gracile fasciculus running up to the gracile nucleus. That's for the legs. So this is the lowest. A little higher up, we've got our upper limb fibers going to the cuneate nucleus. So leg, arm. And input from the face goes to the pontine nucleus of the trigeminal. Follow these fibers up and you'll notice our face, arm, and leg are in about the same relative position as they are in our body. We've got a face, below that would be the arms, and below that the legs. Follow these fibers up to the cortex and you'll see our homunculus emerges. Then we have a collection of both motor and sensory tracts. This is called the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Medial meaning it's near the midline, longitudinal meaning it's running along the length of the brainstem, and fasciculus is just a collection of fibers. That's it. The motor components of the medial longitudinal fasciculus include the descending non-conscious tracts, the tectospinal, reticulospinal, and vestibulospinal tracts. Nothing new here. These do the same thing they did in previous lectures. We also have some ascending tracts, which we will indeed elaborate on in this unit. These deal with uh, controlling the eyes. So the vestibulo-ocular tract moves our eyes in accordance with head movements. The vestibulo-ocular tract is thus critical for creating the VOR. The internuclear tracts connect the uh, gaze centers to the cranial nerve nuclei that control the eyes. Gaze centers are just um, central pattern generators that create fast eye movements. So the intranuclear tracts are for the VOR and the internuclear tracts are very important for saccades. This will get its own lecture. Don't sweat it. But do know that all of those connections within the brainstem are carried in the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Of course, there's another tract with a very similar name, the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus. And this is still the collection of fibers that connect the hypothalamus to preganglionic autonomic neurons. That means the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus will run through the brain stem. That will connect us to parasympathetic cranial nerves. We'll also run down into the thoracic and lumbar spine, getting sympathetic, and to the sacral spine to give us again parasympathetic. Please don't forget your parasympathetic sandwich. This allows our emotions to create a visceral response. As we can see here, this gentleman is unhappy. That anger will cause him to sweat. He'll have an increase in heart rate, decrease in digestion, and nothing too fancy going on below the belt. Different emotions will have different patterns of output. We'll go through cranial nerves 9 through 12 now. Those lower four uh, come off of the medulla. 
and collectively uh, are going to control the mouth, the throat, neck, shoulders, and then viscera of the thorax and abdomen. Now, one of those cranial nerves doesn't come off of the medulla, and that would be the accessory nerve. More on that in just a bit. First, let's get the important nuclei out of the way. The first is the solitary nucleus. This is easy to remember as the sensory nucleus because you will notice solitary and sensory both begin with S. So when you hear nucleus of the solitary tract or the solitary nucleus, please let that S cue you that it's sensory. Now there are a few different parts here. We can divide the solitary nucleus into four subcomponents. The gustatory nucleus is responsible for creating taste. So this gets inputs from cranial nerves 7, 9, and 10. Those three cranial nerves innervate taste buds. There's also a respiratory nucleus. This gets inputs from cranial nerves 9 and 10. The dorsal respiratory nucleus deals with blood gas from cranial nerve 9 and lung stretch from cranial nerve 10 to control our respiratory rate. The baroreceptor nucleus deals with blood pressure, getting input from cranial nerves 9 and 10, which sense the carotid and aorta, respectively. And then there's the commissural nucleus. This is a nucleus important for reflexes. It receives visceral afferents from cranial nerve 10 and creates nifty reflexes like cough. We'll touch on this when we get to the vagus nerve. Just as we have a sensory nucleus, we also have a motor nucleus, and that is the nucleus ambiguous. Notice the M sound in ambiguous. That should cue you that it's motor. It's called ambiguous because it's a little difficult to pick out in a slice. The nucleus ambiguous is found around the top of the medulla and it receives bilateral cortical bulbar input. The output are to muscles involved with swallowing and speaking. Uh, these also deal with breathing because they uh, deal with opening the airway either to create vibrations of air when we speak or to allow air to enter. Cranial nerve 9 deals a lot more with swallowing, but it does assist with speech as well. Cranial nerve 10, important for swallowing and respiration. And there's a cranial accessory nerve, sometimes called cranial nerve 11, uh, that assists the vagus nerve. This is not the same thing as the spinal accessory nerve, which we will go through later. Just keep that in mind. Starting with cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve has important roles uh, with swallowing, speech, salivation, and uh, sensing blood pressure and gas levels. So there's several types of efferents and afferents to deal with. The first class are the general visceral efferents. These are the parasympathetic fibers arising from the inferior salivatory nucleus projecting to the otic ganglion and the postganglionic fibers there innervate the parotid gland to stimulate salivation. A little bit of a zoom in here shows us a slightly better picture where we have the preganglionic fibers here in the inferior salivatory nucleus heading on out, stimulating the postganglionic fibers in the otic ganglion, and those postganglionic fibers stimulate the release of saliva. This is obviously important for feeding. Also important for feeding is the ability to swallow. For this, we have special visceral efferents 
arising from, of course, the nucleus ambiguous. Notice it's motor. And these innervate the stylopharyngeus muscles, helping to elevate the palate. The sensory component of the glossopharyngeal nerve includes the general sensory afferents. These give us sensation of the ear and pharynx. So the internal portion of the tympanic membrane, the pharynx, and the posterior one-third of the tongue all provide fibers to the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal. Thus, this is going to give us ear and throat pain. The general visceral afferents deal with the blood. They project uh, into the carotid the carotid sinus to sense blood pressure and the carotid bodies to sense blood gas. These two types of afferents will go to different components of the nucleus of the solitary tract. Carotid sinus, which senses pressure, goes to the baroreceptor nucleus. And the afferents in the carotid body project to the chemoreceptor nucleus to tell us blood gas levels. So what's the rate of respiration? Then we have special visceral afferents. Special, again, dealing with eating and speaking. So in this case, that special visceral afferent gives us the sensation of taste on the posterior one-third of the tongue. Taste fibers all go to the gustatory nucleus. The vagus nerve also has a big collection of fibers. The vagus nerve is the major parasympathetic nerve. So the general visceral afferents here provides parasympathetic input from throat to colon. Everything in between. These fibers arise not from the nucleus ambiguous, although they are efferents. In this case, it's the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. DM meaning dorsal motor nucleus, X being 10 for vagus. We do, of course, have fibers from the nucleus ambiguous. Those are the special visceral efferents, allowing us to speak and swallow. They innervate the larynx, pharynx, and the upper one-third of the esophagus. The motor, I'm sorry, the sensory components are broken into three parts. Yes, we still have some special visceral afferents for taste. This is very minor. We have some taste buds in the epiglottis to give us the aftertaste, and that's all the vagus contributes. It provides some somatosensation, again, to give us pain because those general uh, uh, special afferents there project to the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal. They serve the back of the ear, the ear canal, tympanic membrane, and the pharynx. So this gives us um, ear and throat pain. Then we have general visceral afferents. General visceral afferents create the visceral reflexes. For example, stretch of the right atrium projects to the commissural nucleus, causing an increase in heart rate. Irritation in the tracheobronchial tree causes us to cough via the commissural nucleus. Stretch of the lungs influences activity in the respiratory nucleus. If our lungs are stretched, there's no need to inhale further. That's the information provided here. And we also have, of course, input to the baroreceptor nucleus based on stretch of the aorta. If there's an increase in blood pressure, that stretches the aorta more. This will then stimulate parasympathetic output to drop blood pressure. So we got a few visceral reflexes carried out as well. The accessory nerve is pretty straightforward here. The spinal accessory nerve, which is what everyone's talking about when they say cranial nerve 11, only contains the general somatic efferents. These innervate two muscles, 
the trapezius and sternomastoid muscles, allowing us to raise our shoulders and turn our heads. Now notice that they arise from the cervical one through five spinal levels. And that's why it's called the spinal accessory nucleus. There are some cranial roots, but those are uh, not typically what folks talk about. Now, since we arise from the spinal cord, we have to re-enter the skull and we enter the cranium through the foramen magnum. That's what's going on down here. But since we, of course, deal with musculature of the neck and shoulders, we have to exit again. So we exit through a different hole, the jugular foramen. Notice we have a couple of extra cranial nerves coming with us, 9 and 10. So 9, 10, and 11 can all be compacted together if anything starts pushing on that jugular foramen and occupying space. In that case, deficits in cranial nerve 11 will cause weakness with head turning, as we can see up here, and it will also cause drooping of the shoulder, scapular winging, and general weakness with shoulder elevation. Moving on, we've got the last cranial nerve of today, cranial nerve 12. The hypoglossal nerve only controls muscles of the tongue. They control all of them other than one, the vagus picks up the slack there. The hypoglossal nerve um, innervates those tongue muscles arising from the hypoglossal nucleus and projecting ipsilaterally to innervate the tongue. Therefore, here we can see the weakness on the subject's left side of the tongue. That means that the left hypoglossal nucleus or the left hypoglossal nerve is affected in that case. Now, two types of input arise to the hypoglossal nucleus. Keep this in mind. We have conscious input from the motor cortex. That way we can do nifty things like talk and control where our tongue is. There's also input from the reticular formation, and this provides feedback during feeding. So we can kind of reflexively move our tongue around, and when we swallow, the tongue is coordinated without requiring any additional input. Because cranial nerves 9 through 11 exit through the jugular foramen together, they can be compressed together by any mass lesion near the base of the skull. And this gives us jugular foramen syndrome. Here, let's zoom on in there a bit, and we can see cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11 exiting together. When they are compressed, this creates a collection of symptoms called jugular foramen syndrome. This includes ear pain from cranial nerves 9 and 10, as well as hoarseness and decreased sensation in the uh, pharynx. It also causes weakness in the muscles for speech, which gives us hoarseness, and compression of cranial nerve 11 causes weakness and wasting in the sternomastoid and trapezius muscles. This concludes our discussion of cranial nerves 9 through 12. If you have any questions, make sure you put them in the questions box so I know what to talk about in class. See you later.